Kenny specializes in helping B2B specialists, coaches, consultants, and other professionals get more clients by making them the obvious best choice to pick. He does this by diving deep into their prospects' wants and needs, and then helping them craft powerful value propositions and marketing funnels directed at those needs. He's going to share some of his wisdom today by showing you how to develop a peak performing value proposition that will form really the foundation of your business model in the years to come for your startup. Enjoy. Kenny, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I must say it's a pleasure to be back here, uh, second year in a row to speak at MIT. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, are you wondering why there's a blank there? Develop a peak performing value proposition for your blank. I bet Andrew's only just noticed this. A little bit about Andrew. He's engineering background and likes things to be prim and proper. And so um, the speakers will attest to this. Beforehand, he wanted us all to have our slides in two weeks in advance. And so I've decided to change my slide slightly just to freak him out a little bit. So today I'm going to do something fairly historical for MIT, no doubt. It's something I got an idea from uh, a good friend of mine and Jen's, Leslie Rohde, um, about five years ago. And he actually gave an audience the opportunity to choose between two different types of presentation. So today... I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to give you the choice of two different types of presentation. Andrew's at the back there thinking, why did I invite this Brit back? Uh, so the first choice is obviously to develop a peak performing value proposition for your startup. That's choice A. Choice B is develop a peak performing value proposition for your sex life. Ken, you did not clear this. <laughs> I know I didn't. So can you just raise your hands if you want to go for A? Okay, we've got quite a few A's there. Raise your hands if you'd like to go for B. That's the majority of the room. Well, I've got good news for both of you because value propositions are extremely versatile. And although we're going to be speaking about startups today, it will actually cover personal areas of your life as well. So we're going to, we're going to start with startups. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware that startups don't have a good reputation of actually succeeding. In fact, eight out of 10 startups fail within the first 18 months. And Forbes have put together a list of three of the biggest reasons that startups fail. Number one, startups don't tend to be in touch with their customers. They get their customers and then they kind of forget about them. So they don't have an open dialogue with their customers. Number two, failure to create and communicate a clear, concise, and compelling value proposition. And number three, there's no real differentiation in the marketplace. Now, all three of those are value proposition related. What you're learning today in this first presentation will be the basis and the foundation for the rest of the presentations you're going to hear today. Because it doesn't sit right with me that eight out of 10 startups fail because they don't have a, a grip of their value proposition. So I don't want to leave the room today until everyone really fully has a grip and understands the power of value propositions. Because the survival and success of your startup depends on the quality of your value proposition. So first of all, let's have a look at what your value proposition is. Well, there's lots of different definitions of value proposition um, all over the place. You know, big, long ones and, you know, grand kind of value propositions. But the nicest one I've seen is by a friend of Andrew and mine. He's called Peter Sandine. And he's put it perfectly for me. It's a collection of the best reasons your target customers have for taking the action you're asking for. So it's just a collection of reasons why your customers should take action. And I think that's 
That's beautiful. By the way, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you where to download these slides. And we're also going to give handouts of the tools and resources that we talk about. So how and where can you use a value proposition? Well, it can be used and should be an internal document. And it should be five of your best reasons your target customers have to take action with you. So it's simple. It's just an internal document. And then once you have that document, like I say, it forms the basis for your whole business model and your whole marketing strategy. You can use it for your website content, your individual landing pages, your adverts, headlines, elevator pitch, your USP, your taglines, your slogans, and presentations. So if you're presenting to get first seed investment, then if you have a strong value proposition, you have a much better chance of succeeding because it's going to have clarity running throughout it all. So what makes a strong value proposition? Well, it answers the following questions. Number one, what is it? Number two, who is it for? What are the features and the benefits? Why is it unique? And most importantly, why is all of that believable? And it has the following attributes. Number one, it's clear and it isn't vague or cryptic. And it's so easy to, when you work in your business, to be unable to see the wood through the trees. And sometimes you need a little bit of perspective. And sit down. Sometimes you need a little bit of perspective to see that you're not being clear. It happened to me recently. I'd just done my whole website, got it all done, thought it looked great, thought it was crystal clear. And I was speaking to Andrew and Peter Sandine. And the feedback I got was it's vague, you know, it's cryptic. And I've been in marketing for 20 years, so it can happen to the best of us. Make sure that it's specific, make sure that it communicates concrete results, and make sure that it communicates any meaningful differentiators. And we'll come on to all of this shortly. And also, it avoids hype, jargon, and superlatives, because everyone's heard of these things and they just don't want to hear any more. And it's consistent throughout all of your marketing strategy. So who can use a value proposition? Well, it can be used in business, and it can be used personally as well. You can have your own value proposition for you as your own personal brand. But let's look at business first. You can use it, so you can have a value proposition for your whole organization. And then you could have separate value propositions that will be based off that original value proposition for product groups. So if you run an e-commerce store, for instance, you could have a value proposition for individual categories. And then you could have individual product value propositions, services value propositions. And if you're recruiting at all, then it's great because you can look at who your target candidates are, do some research on that, and then develop a value proposition around them. You're much more likely to connect with them that way. And for actions as well. So, for instance, if you're looking to create a lead generation part of your business, you may be offering a free um, report or a free download or you know access to your software. Again, you would have your whole value proposition. You would have a singular value proposition based on that, which would be, again, based on your overarching business value proposition. Personally, you could use a value proposition for your thesis or dissertation. Uh, so, for instance, you would look, you would compare whoever marks your dissertation with your customers in business, you'd find out exactly what they are looking for, what, then, what the, mo the biggest reasons are for making you, for get, helping you pass um, and get great results. You can use it for your resume, your cover sheets, your LinkedIn profile, your bio, 
And you could even use it for dating sites if you are single. Um, I'll give you an example of this. My, when I was in my 20s, I'm in my 40s now, but when I was in my 20s, I got to a point where I was looking to settle down. I wanted to meet someone, that right person. And I kept meeting the wrong people. They, my people lived in, you know, I met a girl who was in Norway, so there was a distance thing going on. People who weren't into the same things as me. And so I sat down and I profiled exactly what I was looking for. And then I was able to focus on my personal value proposition. And within two weeks, I met my wife-to-be in my local pub where she used to go. I used to go, and we'd never seen each other before. But because I was now focusing, I was able to meet her. And it's the same with you and your customers. Your value proposition is a reflection of you or your business. So let's have a look at why value propositions are so important and why if you have a weak value proposition, it's like having a leaky bucket. So for instance, if you have a bad value proposition and then you send lots of traffic to your website, then it's akin to pouring water into a bucket full of holes. The problem we have is, according to the New York Times, we get bombarded with around about 5,000 sales or marketing messages every single day. Back in the 80s and 90s, it was probably 30 to 50. So we've now developed these, these subconscious filters to filter out all of the noise. And therefore, your message needs to cut through all of that noise, cut through all of that clutter as fast as possible because people are filtering all of it out all of the time. And typically, you have around about seven seconds to grab their attention and then keep their attention. So, for instance, if somebody is um, landing on your website, subconsciously, they will ask the following seven questions within just seven seconds. The first one is, do I understand what this website is about? Remember before when I mentioned that mine was vague, you know, people were hitting the back button because it was vague. They didn't understand what it was about. I knew what it was about. My team knew what it was about, but not, every, not all of my audience did. Do I think it's relevant to me? Do I think it's valuable information? All of that, those three questions are around about three seconds. Do I want this? Do I trust the source? Whatever they're asking me to do, is the risk acceptable? And then if they answer yes to all of those, you're doing a, a good job. Um, but there's one more question they will ask, and that is, is this worth me going ahead now or putting it off for another day, which generally means not doing it at all? And so you need to be crystal clear with your value proposition. And I'll give you some examples now. Sometimes we have clean home pages or landing pages, and sometimes we have detailed landing pages. Depending on what product or service you sell, sometimes there is a need for more detail. This is an example of a clean home page. Looks clean, doesn't it? Um, but what is it? What do they do? I actually know the guy who runs this website. I've advised him to change it, but he... He won't listen. And what he's looking for is he's a white collar boxing event organizer. So he's looking for white collar boxers. And what happens then is if he gets these white collar boxers, they come and fight at these events and then they all buy tickets and their family buy tickets and friends buy tickets and that's how they make the money. But what does that mean? The ultimate challenge of you got what it takes. You know, if someone lands on there cold, they don't know what it is. So that's a bad, clean home page. Compare that with Dropboxes. You know, it's crystal clear, isn't it? Dropbox works the way you do. 
get to all your files from anywhere on any device and share them with anyone. Crystal clear. Now, Dropbox have the advantage of being very well known, so they can afford to be more um, simple with what they're offering there. But let's have a look at a bad, detailed homepage. You know, I don't even know what this site does. It doesn't answer all of those seven questions. In fact, it looks like the web designer has just vomited on the page. It's awful. So let's get it off the screen fast. If you compare that with this detailed home page, and this is around home security, so it needs to be detailed. There's a reason it's detailed, because people need more details there. And I know the guys who have done the conversion rate optimization for this site, they're called the conversion rate experts. And they've taken this business, or helped to take this business, from a seven-figure business to a nine-figure business by being crystal clear with the value proposition. If you look at it there, immediately, you've got these seven seconds. It says security systems, so you know it's security systems. Then there's a phone number, adding that layer of trust. I can call them up. Then there's um, recommended by New York Times and other areas of credibility there. So I'm building trust very quickly here. Then it's make home feel safe again. So a nice strap line, and it's indicating that it's, it's home security. So I know it's home security. Then they've got Dave Ramsey, who, if you don't know who he is, he's a big financial expert who is on the TV a lot. And so he's endorsing it. So they're starting to differentiate themselves with this now. Then they say it's designed by Harvard-educated engineers. I thought you would all boo at that point. But, uh, <laughs> um, but again, differentiating themselves. And this, this, this is one of your differentiators. Immediately, you have MIT as a layer of credibility for you. You start off with that, which is great. Then it talks about how a Wisconsin police department actually uses it to catch criminals, differentiating, again, adding layers of trust there. Then it says CNET calls it better, smarter home security, more cred credibility. Then it actually covers some objections by saying there's no annual contracts, no middlemen, and no landline needed. And you'll get this for half of what you'd pay elsewhere. So some big benefits there. And then it has an, a lovely kind of strap line, get more security, get more freedom, and get more savings. And then it finishes off with some other credibility elements where they've won awards and stuff. I think the only thing I would change is I would have his image facing inwards because he's leaning outwards there. I'd, I'd probably reverse it so that he's leaning in towards the content. But maybe they've tested it and it works better that way. It usually works better if, if um, people face towards the content. So clarity compels, vagueness repels. So let's now have a look at how to know exactly what your customers want. So this is how you can get what they call an unfair advantage by going beyond the usual attributes of demographics. I'm not saying these are not important, they are. But we can go beyond that. We can dig and find extra layers. And we do this by understanding what important jobs your customers have. Because there's a framework which is known as the jobs to be done framework. And it states that customers buy products not because of the type of person they are, but because they have a personal or work-related job to do. This guy here is called Clayton Christensen. Um, he's a professor at Harvard. No boo, again, I thought we'd get another boo there. Um, and he, he did a wonderful video. Um, he did a, a presentation, and it's on YouTube. And he talks about milkshakes. And he talks about 
how, because he's got a consultancy, talks about how he went to a fast food joint to help them out. They'd spent thousands on market research. They'd had a market research firm in, and they'd come in and they'd interviewed all of these customers and you know, done research groups and said, you know, would you like to buy peanut flavored milkshake? Would you like bigger, um, bigger milkshakes? Would you like um, different types of straws? And they spent all of this money with this first firm and yielded no results. So they brought him and his team in. And so what they did is they sat and they observed for a full day and they noticed that a lot of the people who were buying these milkshakes were buying them before 8 a.m. And they were grabbing them and then jumping into their car and then commuting to work. So the next day they sat down with them and started interviewing these people and asking them questions. And the, the main question they asked was, what job do you hire that milkshake to do? And people were kind of like scratching their head and saying, what do, you, what do you mean? So they reframed the question to, okay, so what did you hire, what else have you hired to do to do the same job? And people started kind of thinking outside of the box at that point and going, okay, I get what you're talking about now. And so they would open up and talk about, well, they'd say, well, I, you know, I've hired a banana before now, but it's, it's over too quickly. And I've hired a Snickers bar, but it's, it creates a bit of a mess. And again, it's over too quickly. The reason I like the milkshake is because I, I have a long commute and it keeps me occupied. And, you know, it's so thick, it takes a while to get up the straw. And, and I can hold it in my hand or I can put it in that, you know, that um, container there. So it just fits perfectly. And also, it, it keeps me full till 11 a.m. till I have my next snack. I don't care what the ingredients are as long as it fills me up. And so by asking these extra layers of questions, they got much deeper answers from the audience and were able to define that there was definitely a job that that milkshake did. Now, when you're looking at the jobs to be done framework, there's three different types of jobs customers have to do, what we have to do. One of them is functional and that is getting a task done or solving a problem. The next one is how a customer wants to be perceived by others, which is the social aspect. And then the third one is emotional, which is how a customer wants to feel. Now, a job can contain all of these or just one of these. And by asking questions, you will find out. Also, once you've found the jobs, you want to look at the related pain of those jobs. So which negative outcomes does the customer want to avoid? So let's use the example of buying sneakers for the gym. We call them trainers in the UK, but buying sneakers for the gym. If you were to look at the functional aspect, the functional pain, um, so when you're looking at pain, you're looking at the possible pain before they've bought it, during the process of buying it or after they bought it. In this example, a functional pain would be sneakers falling apart after the first run or just falling apart quickly and therefore losing their investment. So there's a pain there and that's a functional pain. A social pain would be other gym members thinking I look stupid. And an emotional pain would be feeling miserable and unfit and unhappy because I've still not bought those sneakers. And then once we've looked at the pains, we then look at the related gains. So which positive outcomes does the customer want or desire? So with the same example, on the functional, you would have, you know, sneakers are durable, they save money long term. You know, social, other gym members think I look good, I fit in at the gym. And emotional, feeling fit and healthy because I've got these great sneakers. And so these are all your benefits. And what you would do at this point is you would kind of measure which are the most important benefits out of a one to 10. Because this is what's gonna form your value proposition. 
Also, at this point, you want to look at the context of the job that needs to be done. So, for example, hunger causes the job of needing to eat, but it has different situations, it has different contexts. So, if I go, if I'm in a rush, you know, at lunchtime, I'm working, then I'll go to a fast food joint. If I'm eating out with the kids, I'll go to a family friendly restaurant. If I'm on date night with my beautiful wife, I'll take her somewhere where hopefully she'll be impressed. So I'm the same demographic, I'm the same person, um, with the same job to be done there, but there's a different context. And we need to be aware of this when we're looking at developing our products and also when we're looking at developing our offers and our messages for our marketing. See, this helps you look beyond the usual attributes. So commit to knowing their jobs and you will uncover the magnetic pull of their needs. And that brings us on how to stand out, get noticed, and be the obvious choice. Now, most startups get ignored or fail because they develop solutions for jobs that don't need to be done. They develop solutions that they think need to be done without doing any research. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't just get on and, and build your startup, but for the sake of a couple of weeks of research, you can uncover some absolute gems. And I'll also show you very shortly how to how to do some research um, in the resources section without having any customers as well. Now, at this stage, you've got a collection of ideas. You know, you've got the related pains and gains of jobs. You've kind of worked out the context of the jobs. Now it's time to see whether your product or services actually have um, a relationship with these jobs, and if not, create them. So on the right there, you can see here, this is the customer job section. So this is your customer profile. You've got your gains and your pains of the jobs, and then on the left-hand side here, you've got your products and services. And if your products or services have a match, so you've got gain creators, that match with the gains that are needed and pain relievers that match with the pains that people are trying to get rid of, then you've got a good fit. And I'll show you how to get this canvas. This is by um, Strategizer Guys. And um, we'll show you where to get this in the resources section. So once you have this information, then it's time to look at your competitors. So focus on where you perform better and or differentiate on the pain relievers and the gain creators. You know, what is the point in focusing on where you are weak? You know, acknowledge where you're weak. And if you can't get better in those areas, then don't focus your attention on those areas. So now you've got all of this, it's time to laser focus to the crucial ideas, which is three to five of the best ideas, preferably just three ideas where possible. Um, you, can, you can have more ideas that you can use later for your arsenal, but the more you focus on a few benefits, the more power your startup will have. And be really good at those three ideas, three to five ideas. Each idea can be a few words or a few sentences. It can be a claim, a promise, or a description, or a statement. So it's simple. I just have mine on an A4 sheet of paper in Word. So once you've got this, it's now time to make it more believable. Because the problem with being a startup is, unfortunately, you know, if you're new and unknown, then by default, people will doubt what you say. It's, it's only those filters working. You know, we've got these 5,000 sales and marketing messages 
it in us every day, we need to filter. I was in the gym this morning at the hotel, and I've got this screen in front of me. I'm, I'm running, and I've got this screen in front of me just selling me stuff the whole time. And then I go down to um, the restaurant downstairs for breakfast, and they've got three TVs with different things going on. I've got someone selling um, slip or trip, um, what do they call it over here, personal injury stuff there. And then I've got someone selling insurance there. I've got to filter this out. And so we need, we need to make it believable. You've got your value proposition. It's now time to make it believable. And we can do this by using strengthening factors. So these are supporting factors. So number one, be specific where possible. So for example, six... 1,543 members already use and love our solution. Um, we, are, we, we, we are programmed at the moment. This may change. You know, we may get uh, specific blindness. Um, but at the moment, we're kind of, we believe specific numbers a lot more than rounded numbers. So be specific. Avoid cliches and hyperboles, like I said before. So the most wonderful dress in the world or the most beautiful dress in the world. Everyone's saying that. We will filter it out. So avoid those. Show them how where possible. So explain how you create the results you promise. So on my homepage of my website, findtheedge.com, we explain how we get the results. We use a three-step system where the first step, we do a deep dive discovery to find out, to help our clients find out their customers' needs by going through this process. And we develop a strong and powerful peak performing value proposition for them. The second step is we then create messaging and help them craft their offers around this. And then the third step, we help them create a needs nurture sales and marketing funnel, which is a strategy um, which helps them automate the process of the sales and marketing using this value proposition and the messages we've helped them create. And we help them attract and win great clients by doing this. And, and because we show them, people are more presupposed to believe it. Stories are really good as well. So tell relatable stories. And this might be a story about yourself, might be a story about your business, might be a story about your products. Um, you can tell fictional stories. People are more predisposed to believe fictional stories, um, to believe stories, I should say, and, and fictional stories come under that. Um, obviously, if you're telling a fictional story, just ensure that it's obvious that it's a fictional story. Um, guarantees, so remove the risk um, by creating a guarantee that's better than a money-back guarantee because, again, we're starting to get guarantee blindness because there's so many guarantees out there. Offer results in advance. So you might offer a free download, um, a test drive, a trial, a sample. Show them how good you are. So present to them like what I'm doing now or do webinars or videos. You know, if you've got any good PR, then, you know, featured in. Show logos of publications. Studies and facts, so according to a study of 987 patients, and then some facts. A little tip there is if you're going to use facts, then put the fact at the beginning of your statement because people are more predisposed to believe facts, so, you then, so they're more predisposed to believe what you say next. Use case studies, the more relatable to the target customer, the better. What others say, as we saw before, Dave Ramsey, you know, celebrity endorsements or industry expert endorsements. And of course, customer testimonials. But with testimonials, video works better. It's more believable. It's a lot harder to get someone to do a video. Um, address specific goals, doubts, or objections. So make sure when you're asking questions for a testimonial, make sure you cover those aspects. They'll be a lot more powerful. So now it's time to create a compelling value proposition by 
getting together the three to five best reasons your customers have for taking the action you're asking for. And then add strong supporting factors to make it believable. A compelling value proposition will equal a confident you. If you are confident in your value proposition, you will feel it in every cell of your body. And you will go forward super confident, which will really help you and your business. So some quick tools and resources for VP creation. Andrew's going to hand out this handout so you don't need to make notes. So interviewing customers, if you want to learn how to interview customers, then a great site is jobstobedone.org. Um, the guys who run that are really good around the jobs to be done stuff. They have a great course that you can purchase on there. I have no affiliation with them, but they, it's, a, it's a very good course. I've done it. Um, there's the christensen.institute.org and strategin.org, all the kind of founders of the jobs to be done framework. If you can't interview customers, then the next best thing is to survey them. And you can use tools like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. And if you can't get access to customers, then you can eavesdrop them. And you know, ways to do this is just to go on forums and just hang out on forums where you know they're hanging out. And you know, groups like LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn groups and uh, Facebook groups. And you know, if you've got physical products, then look on Amazon, look at what people are moaning about, about your competitors' products, and look at what they like about your competitors' products. Look at their jobs to be done. A good little tool um, to use to search Facebook groups is called um, Postradamus. It's not, not easy to say. Um, and what that has been designed for is to actually search content across like Facebook pages, Facebook groups, um, YouTube groups, uh, sorry, YouTube uh, videos, um, all of that kind of stuff, Pinterest and stuff. What it does is it shows you the highest performing content, so those that are being shared the most. And what you can use it for in this instance is to just find the groups where you know your target audience are hanging out, find the most um, popular posts on there, you know, once you go beyond the, the silly posts, like you know, um, surfing dogs and stuff like that, um, get the real posts and then look within those posts and look at what people, what jobs people have to do and what pains they have related to those jobs. Look in the comment section. You'll get some really good juice there. So you can get this, the strategy, Strategizer Value Proposition Canvas at strategizer.com. And these guys have also written a great book, which is called Value Proposition Design, which is a sequel to Business Model Generation. And what I would say about the, this book is buy the actual physical book rather than the Kindle version, because it's got some good illustrations that really help the book. And then there's the Jobs to be Done Handbook by Chris Speak and Bob Moresta, the guys from jobstobedone.org. So let's just do a quick summary of what we've covered today. So first of all, a value proposition is a collection of the best ideas, the best reasons your customers have for taking the action you're asking them to take. It can be used for your whole organization or parts of, such as products, services, and actions. It can be used personally as well as we discovered. Um, be crystal clear if you don't want to lose your prospects to your competitors, because clarity compels and vagueness repels. Go beyond demographics and look at the jobs to be done. Look at the functional, social, and emotional pains and gains associated with the jobs to be done. Look at the context of the jobs to be done and compare how you address the pains and gains compared to your competitors and focus on your strong points. And then map out the three to five best ideas using the value proposition canvas. And then add supporting factors to make it believable. If you develop a peak performing value proposition, you are much more likely to follow in the footsteps of guys like this, MIT startup masters. Thank you very much for listening today.
Okay, so you might be wondering how you can quickly develop a peak performing value proposition for your business and much, much more. If so, the next step is really simple. It's for you to have a quick conversation with me. Just going to be really friendly chat where I answer any of your questions, you know, if you have any, and then I ask you some questions about your business and your goals just to work out if or how I can help you. If I feel like I can, we'll talk about how. If I think that I can't help, then I'll let you know very politely and point you in the right direction. Okay, so the purpose of this short clarity session is to get crystal clear about what's possible for you in terms of income, impact, and the freedom you want to get within and outside of your business. We're going to uncover the biggest roadblocks that are stopping you. And we're going to find the exact place of where we can start to get your referral system set up. The information we get will allow us to create a three-step action plan so that we can identify the most powerful actions to start generating more clients for you immediately and more great clients as well so that you can leave confident, excited, and inspired to take your business to that next level fast. Now, the next step is really simple. It's just to fill in a quick two-minute questionnaire. So just click the button or the link below this video. If you can give me two to three minutes to tell me about you, then I can prep before our session. And if, like I say, you're interested in discussing how I can help you, whether that's through my mentoring programs or whether it's through you know, consulting and doing everything for you, for your business then you might be wondering, well, how do I differentiate myself from all of my competitors out there? Well, hopefully you've seen that I've been in this industry of selling high value services and products for nearly 20 years now. And I come from a real business background, a real coaching background, a real mentoring background. And there's another big reason that we're totally different. And let me just explain what that is here and now. Not only do we cover tailored strategies, high-performing new ideas and shifts in thinking along with accountability, when you get accepted into the inner circle, you don't just get me and my skill set. You see, my skill set is client generation. I know it inside out and I know the overall strategy and many tactics I know to a T, but no one mentor, coach or consultant should or could claim to be an expert in everything. They just can't. And that's why when you join me as a client, you also get access to my elite contacts without any charge if you feel that you need them. These are the people who help me with my business. These are specialists in specialist areas and they're the world's best at what they do. And you'll see why in a moment. I'll just go through a few of them now. We've got Mark Williams, who's a LinkedIn expert known as Mr. LinkedIn. And he's not only a LinkedIn expert, he's a super smart guy. Used to run a recruitment business, a really successful recruitment business. And then he went into training and hyper focuses on LinkedIn. Then we've got Jen Sheehan on social media. Now her portfolio is ridiculous. She's helped Barack Obama with his social media campaign in 2012. She's helped the UK Conservative Party win their election. She's helped Amazon, eBay. She's helped Tony Robbins. I mean, the list just goes on. Anyone who's anyone wants Jen to do their social media and you will have direct access to her. We've got Andrew Percy, who is an MIT trained engineer and Google partner, and he specializes in Google pay-per-click. And he's one of the brightest, most analytical people I know. And that's what you need when you're doing Google pay-per-click. And he just gets amazing results. Then we've got Nick Sal, who's inbound automation, who's used to work within HubSpot and managed a lot of their campaigns for them. And then we've got Craig Miller, who is a speaking expert. So he helps you if you're looking to create a really good presentation. And if you're really keen, he can actually help you 
do a TED talk or TEDx talk, because that's what he also specializes in. And he can actually help you get to talk at a TEDx event because he has a portfolio of pretty much most of the TED talks that are done around the world. And he knows exactly what the organizers of those events are looking for. Um, but if you're just looking to do, you know, good presentations, be able to speak better, he can help with that as well. And the good thing about all of these mentors and consultants here is that they love helping smaller businesses. They enjoy working with the big corporates as well, which is what they do, but they also love helping smaller businesses because they all run small businesses themselves and their businesses are successful in their own right and they don't help me out and help my clients out for the sheer fun of it, although they do enjoy it. Neither do they take these calls lightly. They know us. They know that we have a rigorous selection process so we keep the group very, very exclusive. And they know that they learn from it as well. And they know that if they nurture the group as well, that they eventually generate great clients through being referred by my clients. And some of my clients use their services as well. So it's a complete win-win for everyone involved. Incidentally, two of the experts that you see on screen there have come through my mentoring program as paid clients. Now, this group of mentors that you can see on your screen right now, this is a growing group. So whatever your biggest challenges are, we've seen them and we know how to overcome them. So what will happen when you complete the form is you'll be able to book a date to chat on our calendar system, a date that's convenient for you. Then my lovely assistant, Rebecca, will be in touch telling you what to prepare for the call. And then we'll either do it by Skype or we can do it by phone. And we'll just focus very, very quickly to get clarity on your business and get to know each other better. Just remember, though, for this particular round, I am doing all the calls personally myself and not being done by any of my other consultants. So there is only one of me. So it's very limited on the amount of calls I can actually do. So if you are interested, then I do urge you to apply now. Thanks so much for attending the training today. It's been a fantastic session and it's been great to work with you on your journey. And I hope that I get to chat with you personally on a clarity session, either this week or next. I'm Kenny Goodman and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.